Hello everyone, uh, I'm Johan. Today we will introduce you our latest work and show you a new reason why you need to partition your deep learning models when serving them. And this is a joint work of me, Lian Ming, Ying Ming, and many others on the slide. And let me start with a typical story of why previously people talk about model parallelism. So three years ago, OpenAI released this the GPT-3 model with 175 billion parameters. And this model is recognized as one of the biggest breakthroughs in deep learning. And it powers exciting applications like ChatGPT, which is the biggest news in tech, the hype of the hype recently. And from a more global perspective, we can see that people are still trying to use larger and larger models. And the GPT-3 model has 175 billion parameters, meaning that its parameters take 350 gigabytes of memory. And however, the most popular accelerators you can get right now still only has 40 to 80 gigabytes of memory. And the size of GPT-3 is significantly larger than the size of a single accelerator. Therefore, we need to transform the way we run deep neural networks from putting everything onto a single GPU to a distributed model parallel version. So where we partition a single neural network and distribute the parts to different devices. Um, model parallelism is complicated. So for different neural networks and cluster setups, the optimal partition can be completely different. And this is also why two years ago, we started to build the Alpha compiler to help people distribute neural networks with model parallelism. And as a brief summary, uh, the conventional motivation for model parallelism is to scale large models beyond the memory limit of a single GPU. And most previous works actually on model parallelism actually focus on deep learning training. And that's also why this session is called Train the Bits. And in this work, we are actually focusing on a different scenario, deep learning serving. So typically, you only need to train your deep neural network once, but you need to deploy and serve that trained model for a long period of time. And this makes the cost of serving to be actually higher than training. And a deep learning cluster typically has the following structure. A deep learning serving uh, cluster typically has the following structure. So given a GPU cluster, we put deep learning models onto the different GPUs and possibly replicating some models. And we also have a gateway or controller to dispatch the request. And the incoming request will first go into the request queue. And for each incoming request, the gateway will dispatch it to a GPU that has the requesting model. And then the GPU will execute the request and return the results. And in the real world, the request to a specific model often comes in bursts. So for example, let's say one day a specific filter on a camera app went viral, and then the number of requests to that filter's neural network will suddenly get very high. And on the slides, we show a real world tr a request pattern, and we can see that these spikes are all indicating request bursts. And now let me start to introduce this work's core idea with the following illustrative example. So suppose we want to serve two deep learning models, model A and model B, on two GPUs, GPU 1 and GPU 2, uh, with the fact that the model sizes are relatively large and close to the GPU memory, so we can only fit one model onto one GPU. And without model parallelism, the only way to serve both models is to put one model on one GPU. Say we put model A on GPU 1 and model B on GPU 2. And now, suppose we face a burst of requests to model A. And in this case, we can only send, the re send this request to GPU-1, because only GPU-1 has model A's weight replica. If we visualize these requests in a timeline, we can see that although GPU-1 can be fully utilized, GPU-2 will be completely idle. However, with model parallelism, we can put both, GPU both models on both GPUs. So for example, with Python parallelism, we can put the first half of the layers of both models on GPU-1 and the second half of the layers on GPU-2. And in this case, for a burst of Model A's request, we can execute them in a pipeline fashion. So specifically, after GPU-1 finishes processing the first half of one request, it can send the intermediate results to GPU-2 and immediately start on the next request. And in fact, now we no longer need to distinguish between Model A and Model B's request. We can serve all of them with the, with the both GPUs. 
So in this case, as long as we have requests coming in, we can achieve a 100% utilization for both GPUs. And in other words, we can statistically multiplex the two GPUs for the two models. And from the previous example, we can see that besides the conventional motivation to scale large models, for deep learning serving, we can adopt model, model parallelism for, for the statistical multiplexing of GPUs when serving multiple models, even if a single model can fit into a single GPU. And we also validated the previous example with the transformers and on actual GPUs with different request distributions. So even for the most uniform distribution, where each model, model's request follow a equal Poisson process, model parallelism can still achieve a 1.3x speed up. And for more bursty requests or uneven requests to the two models, model parallelism can provide an even larger speed up. The speed up comes from the better for better burst tolerance. When a burst arrives that exceeds the capability of a single GPU, the baseline will begin queuing requests. However, model parallelism can use two GPUs to smoothen the request, so the queue can be much shorter. And here, we show an example cluster utilization curve of the previous experiments. Note that for each request burst, model parallel placement can use the whole cluster and and only half of the and use only half of the time to process, while the baseline can only use half of the cluster. And just now we see how model parallelism helps the two model two GPUs example. Um, however, in the real world, we are facing a much more complicated problem it involves many more models and larger clusters. And next, I will hand over to Yingming to tell you how we tackle this more complicated case in Alpacer. So hi, I'm Yimmy. Next, I'm going to show you how we expand our ideas from previous simple example to the real world cases. We mainly answer three questions step by step. First, real world scenario is much more complicated and has many factors like GPU memory capacity, request arrival pattern, and service level objective. We want to know how does these factors affect the benefits brought by model parallelism and whether the gains still hold. Second, there are different model parallel strategies, and we want to know their specific benefits and overheads to guide our algorithm design. Last, we want to know how to navigate the complex trade-off space when serving many models on a large cluster. Now we start to investigate the first question. We begin our real-world journey with device memory capacity. We tested how does the mean latency changes under different memory budget. Note that we use a simulator here to generate the results that go beyond the memory limit of a single GPU. We can see that model parallelism helps a lot when GPU memory is limited and below the physical memory bound. With more memory, the replication baseline can have more model replicas, thus the benefit of statistical multiplexing diminishes. Next, we start with the request arrival pattern, Spe specifically, when the total request rate is relatively low, model parallelism can help reduce the serving latency. However, when the total arrival rate approaches the peak serving rate of the cluster, the benefit of model parallelism starts to diminish due to the overhead of model parallelism. On the other hand, when the incoming requests become more bursty, model parallelism can further outperform the baseline. In the real-world setting, it is common to have request deadlines, or SLO. In this case, our goal is to maximize the percentage of requests served before the deadline. We call this metric SLO attainment in our paper. We find that when SLO is tight, model parallelism can greatly improve the SLO attainment. But when the SLO becomes looser, its performance plateaus, but the baseline keeps improving. This result shares the same core logic as previous experiments. When SLO becomes looser, the system is bounded by its total processing capability, which is affected by the model parallelism overhead. To summary, we can answer the first question. Model parallelism can greatly benefit model serving when we have limited per device memory, below system peak throughput overall request rate, 
high request burstiness, and a tight SLO. Surprisingly, we find these properties greatly match the real-world model serving scenario, confirming our confidence to apply model parallelism to more complicated real-world cases. From the previous experiments, we can see that the overhead of model parallelism will let us perform worse than the baseline in some cases. So where do the overheads come from, and how will they influence the serving performance? From training world, current model parallelism strategies can be generally classified into two categories. For interoperator parallelism, where we catch the neural network into multiple stages and execute in a pipeline fashion. The overhead comes from two parts. The communication between the different stages and the overhead of the slowest pipeline stage from the uneven partition. For intraoperator parallelism, where we partition the individual operators of a neural network, the overhead mainly comes from the heavy synchronization across multiple devices. We benchmark the two parallel strategies and the replication baseline under three metrics, latency, throughput, and memory, as we scale the number of parallel degrees. We found that interoperator parallelism will slightly increase the latency of a single input but has a relatively high throughput. On the contrary, intraoperator parallelism reduces the latency, but also incur a high throughput overhead. The replication baseline method will not affect the latency and has a perfect linear scaling for throughput. However, it also has the highest memory usage due to replication of the models. After investigating Q1 and Q2, we found that not only different real-world factors will affect the performance, but each parallel strategy has its own pros and cons. So how to navigate this complex trade-off space? To this end, we build OpaServe, a serving system that focuses on, first, find efficient model parallel strategies with low overhead, and second, determine placement with combined parallelism strategies according to the arrival pattern to maximize the SL attainment. Next, I will give a very high-level sketch view of these two parts. You can check out the details in our paper. Define an efficient model parallel inference plan with low overhead. We modify Alpha's auto-parallel algorithm for inference. Overall, we generate many strategies with different inter- and intra-operator parallel degrees. In inter-operator paths, we minimize the maximum stage latency to reduce the uneven partition overhead. In intra-operator paths, we drop data parallel configurations and leave replication to the placement algorithm. To place the models onto the cluster, we propose a two-stage placement algorithm that first, partition the cluster into groups of devices and assign a shared model parallel configuration for the group, and then place model replicas to different groups to maximize the final SLO attainment. We use the simulator-guided greedy algorithms for both stages. We deploy OpaServe on the 64 GPUs AWS cluster to serve many BERT and transformer MLE models of six different sizes on the production trace released by Microsoft. We compare OpaServe with Clockwork, the previous SOTA solution to model serving, and the replication baseline as we discussed earlier. If any, the dotted vertical line shows when the corresponding algorithm achieves 99% SL attainment. As for the arrival rate, to serve the same workload with the 99% SL attainment, ARPA serve can tolerate 10x request rate. Similarly, ARPA serve can handle six times more burstiness or 2.5 times more stringent SLO. You can check out our paper for more experiments. In summary, our key idea is quite simple. We use model parallelism to statistically multiplex the GPUs when serving multiple models, even if a single model can fit into a single GPU. We extend this idea to the production environment and design a new serving system, OpaServe, to navigate the complex trade-off space. The project is open sourced, and you can check the code following the GitHub link. Thanks for listening. We are glad to take questions in the Q&A session.